we are just going to go through week by week and talk a little bit about each of the chapters in turn. So two weeks ago, it was the introduction. Today is chapter one, which is called The Human Niche. And I'm going to read just two pages from a section called Culture Versus Consciousness. And this is a topic to which, you know, which we have discussed here and which we discussed in a talk that we gave virtually at Princeton a year ago, 13 months ago or so, and which we expand on quite a lot in the penultimate chapter of the book. So we'll be coming back to this, uh, to these topics um, in, I guess, 11 weeks. So culture versus consciousness. Consciousness is valuable for problem solving, but it isn't so good for execution. The gymnast, the virtuoso, and the warrior all succeed by taking what they have discovered consciously and learning to apply it without explicit deliberation. Transformative insights and ideas move out of the conscious layer and into the parts of us that know how to get things done. When one is in the zone, the conscious mind is present, but as a spectator who steers clear so as not to disrupt the flow. Behaviors become habitual and intuitive. In an individual, we might call this skill or craft. In a family or a tribe, such habits become traditions, passed efficiently from one generation to the next. Scale this up further, and we have culture. Homo sapiens therefore oscillate between two dominant modes. When we face problems for which our prior understanding is inadequate, we become conscious. How do we feed ourselves in this new land? We plug our minds into a shared problem-solving space and share what we know. Then we parallel process, proposing hypotheses, providing observations, offering challenges, until we arrive at a new answer, one that an individual would rarely reach alone. If the result works well when tested in the world, it gets refined and then driven into a more automatic, less deliberative layer. This is culture. The application of culture to the circumstances for which it is adapted is the population level equivalent of an individual being in the zone. This model implies a few important things. When times are good, people should be reluctant to challenge ancestral wisdom, their culture. In other words, they should be comparatively conservative. When things aren't going well, people should be prone to endure the risks that come with change. They should be comparatively progressive, liberal, if you will. This, of course, has a lot to say about the modern world, because for various reasons, there is little agreement at present on how well things are going. Moments before the Titanic hit the iceberg, the ship was a marvelous testament to human achievement. Moments after, it was a monument to the hazard of hubris. Too often, it is only in retrospect that the rearrangement of deck chairs appears absurd. More often than not, there is no iceberg, no clear demarcation of before and after of the moment when consciousness should become more salient than culture. The financial collapse of 2008, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, and the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster are all symptoms of a civilization-level disorder, one that has no name. Let's call it the sucker's folly. The tendency of concentrated short-term benefit not only to obscure risk at long-term cost, but also to drive acceptance even when the net analysis is negative. These events are evidence that we are resting on our cultural laurels and speeding toward disaster, lulled into a false sense of security and away from collective consciousness by the opulence of our surroundings. The sooner we recognize this, the greater the chance to divert the ship to a safe course, a puzzle we will return to in the last chapter of this book. The answer to our earlier question then, what is the human niche, is this. Humans don't have a niche, not in the standard sense of the term. We have escaped the paradigm by mastering a different game. We have discovered how to swap out our software and replace it as the need arises by oscillating between culture and consciousness. The human niche is niche switching. Humanity is the master of every trade. If we were machines, we would be ones that are compatible with many software packages. The Inuit hunter knows the Arctic, but has few of the skills needed to function in the Kalahari or the Amazon. Humans can be good at almost anything, given the proper tools and software, and human populations can be good at many things by virtue of a division of labor. But each individual person will either have to limit themselves or accept the costs that come with being a generalist. As our world becomes increasingly complex, though, the need for generalists grows. We need people who know things across domains and who can make connections between them. Not just biologists and physicists, but biophysicists. People who have switched gears and found that the tools they brought from their prior vocation serve them well in a new one. We must find ways to encourage the development of generalists. In this book, we argue that a key way to do this is to encourage a careful, nuanced understanding of what evolution is, what it has made us, and how we can resist its goals. I am so excited to have this finally in the world. It's going Me to be too. very useful. And I should just uh, point out that the book itself and this podcast are exercises in campfire. Hence my reference to it in the tweet that uh, pointed my followers here. And it is something that is uh, it is very live for us. 
We participate in campfire to exchange ideas consciously and figure out what we should think about things that none of us have seen before. I would also point out not on that list of disasters in there is COVID-19. And mm -hmm. now that John Stewart has finally cracked the case, um, we can recognize that this is yet one more uh, likely testament to that same dynamic. So, well, and as as you wrote about in your most recent unheard piece as as well, right? So we will, um, if I remember to, we'll we'll link that as well in the video description. Um, yeah, maybe maybe that's it. Except that one of the other things I want to do whenever we talk about um, the book is uh, just read a little bit from the index because this index tickles me deeply. We we when we received it just whenever it was three weeks ago or so, uh, we were we were laughing. Um, pleased at it because it really it really reveals how diverse a list of things we talk about in the book is. So starting in the middle of A, middle of A, this is only a third of what is in A in the index, uh, we have allocation trade-offs, altriciality, American dream, amniotes, amphibians, anisogamy, sapphire mining in Ankarana, anti-anxiety medications, antibiotics, antidepressants, anti-fragility, Ants, apes, appendix, Arctic terns, Aristotle, art, Solomon Ash, who will come up again in this episode, asexual reproduction, astrology, Atlantic spotted dolphins, Rachel Aviv, and obviously ayahuasca. Um, so, in my opinion, when you read from the index, it should be a little more crazed, a little more wild eyed. Do you want to do it? No, I don't actually. <laughs> uh, yes, this is actually one of my terrors from childhood was uh, being really forced cool. to read out loud. Yes, I've never, uh, it's never been a, a strong suit for me. And yet you're happy to advise me that I need to be a bit more crazed. Oh, bad. Anti fragility, <laughs> ants, apes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so I have a question for you. I mean, as long as. Yeah. Uh, the index of the book has become a subject of the podcast, I have to know. Oh, boy. Okay. Let's suppose there was more than one book and therefore more than one index. Indexes or indices? I, I feel it's indices. Yeah, I do too. And I think maybe we're wrong. And I don't remember why, if so. Wrong, you say. That somehow doesn't feel right. <laughs> I honestly don't remember. I, I, this is this is something that grammarians, of course, have an opinion on. And um, you know, in so far as there's no pressing need to change how it is that we're supposed to do it, um, simply messing with all of the things that we've always done at the same time is obviously another recipe for disaster. So why not leave those things that do function, even if it's not what you thought they were, alone already? Um, but I honestly actually don't know which it is in this case. Yes. So the question is left hanging in the air. Hanging. Hung. I, I don't know. <laughs> That's another weird one. You know, hanged versus hung. Yeah, it yeah, is. It is. It is. 